Radio. Hey, I'm Dave Asprey. This is Bulletproof Radio. And today's cool fact of the day is that people who lead cerebrally stimulating lives, people who use their brains a lot, seem to develop an extra capacity so that as they age and even after they retire or later in life, they maintain some of what they built up over life. So if you're not leading a cerebrally stimulating life where you read and you talk with smart and interesting people, then you may actually pay for that later in life. So start paying attention, it's good for you. And there actually is a study about what I just said. Today's guest on the show is a friend, uh, an incredibly awesome guy, and the creator of the Flow Genome Project, Stephen Gottler. How are you, Dave? It's good to see you again, Stephen. Nice to see you. You've been on Bulletproof Radio, but today you were on stage at the Bulletproof Biohacking Conference, and since we're actually in the same physical location, I wanted to get a chance to record an episode with you where we could get it on video, and instead of being over Skype, we could just chat. It's awesome. But people have already heard your story about flow state. It's true. They know that you cured your Lyme disease through surfing uh, with a, actually a prescription. So you had an insurance company pay for your surfboard. <laughs> okay, maybe not. But you've been doing some work with animals that's remarkable and I think has applications for, for humans as well. Things about pack instinct and all. And I want to talk with you about that because people have no clue that awesome. you do this. Awesome, okay. Tell me about animals. What do you do with animals? Uh, my wife and I run an animal sanctuary in northern New Mexico called Rancho de Chihuahua. We specialize in small dogs with really big problems. So most of our dogs come to us directly kind of from uh, vets, usually with dire warnings, three weeks to live, a month at most. Um, primarily hospice care or special needs care. And um, invariably, our dogs live forever. A lot of it comes down to nutrition and our healing methodology, which is based around flow states. So uh, on the flow side, right, we, we take the dogs together as a huge pack into the back country every day. We usually do three to five miles running up and down mountains with the dogs and we put them into group flow situations. Like how, how many dogs is this? Uh, 37 is our count for right now. It goes so, up and down. So, so you go for a run with 37 chihuahuas chasing you? Well, the, the packs go from chihuahuas up to pit bulls, but let's say 22 chihuahuas chasing me, and that's a bigger dog, yes. So, so I, I have a, a drone, one of those drone camera things. It, it's awesome. And there's a Kickstarter right now where you can put a little thing on your belt, and then your drone will follow you. And you can get that HD aerial footage. So I want HD aerial footage of you running oh, up no, a mountain. Oh, no, it's like the David Attenborough film. Yeah, yeah but, we can but do what's this. just a crowd of, of small dogs chasing you? This I, is fabulous. We can do this. Th yeah, and, this and is maybe in slow motion so you can see their ears flopping. and They can uh, move in slow motion. <laughs> All right. So, so this puts dogs in a flow state. It does. One of the, uh, one of the <laughs> so, so this is really, this is actually really cool. The, the, one of the qu old questions from an evolutionary purpose is where does flow come from, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the standing thinking has been for a really long time that when we came down from the trees and onto the veld and started running down our prey, right? We had to run massively long distances. So obviously anybody who got a little more pain relief, you know, neurochemically of course, got a little more, a little more flow would have an advantage, right? One of the things that people started to realize is that very quickly after we started running on our prey, we uh, started co-evolving with dogs. We were living with wolves, yeah. right? We, we were co-evolved. And we started pack hunting with wolves. And the new thinking is that flow may have evolved as a communication technology. So what happens in flow, as we know, is one of the things that happens is pattern recognition goes through the roof, right? So when you're hunting, large mammals, you're trying to bring down a buffalo and it's you and a pack of wolves and blah, blah, blah. If you don't have perfect communication, if you've, never, if you've ever run with a pack of, of dogs or wolves through the back country and you're not in flow, you're gonna be tripping all over dogs. <laughs> you're gonna end up dead trying to hunt a buffalo that way and you need to be able to coordinate. So flow, all of the chemicals are very, very powerful social bonding chemicals, right? All the neural chemicals that show up in flow, norepinephrine and dopamine is romantic love. Anandamine is that bro sense people get when stoned. Endorphins is maternal love uh, for, between mother and infant as, or social bonding as adults. All the same things show up. 
Um, so the new thinking is that flow may have evolved as a you know a way to heighten kind of nonverbal cross species communication, so people could hunt animals. And they actually uh, th there's also <laughs> research on this, and it was done at the University of Arizona. And what they were looking at is anandamide, right, which is one of the chemicals that shows on flow. So they trained humans, and it took some training, um, and dogs and ferrets to work on, to run on a treadmill. And exercise induced transient hypofrontality when your prefrontal cortex shuts off, usually shows up after like 20, 25 minutes of, of medium exercise, and anandamide gets released. And they looked. There was an anandamide in the humans, there was an anandamide in the dogs, and there was none in the ferrets, because they're not social species. So okay. ferrets perhaps can't get into flow, but dogs definitely can. <clears throat> So if a dog can get into flow and a human can get into flow, your hypothesis is that there's some communication interspecies well, pattern, pa So them? one of the things that I've discovered when I run with my dogs, like when I was first doing it, mm -hmm. when, we start, we, when we weren't getting into flow together, I was tripping all over them. They were tripping all over me. I went face first into a cactus one day. Um, but once we started getting into flow together, and you can really feel it, something shifts. You can, you can really tell when it happens. Your pattern recognition, so your senses are heightened, right? You have norepinephrine and dopamine. You're taking in more information per second, mm -hmm. right? And you're processing it more quickly and you faster pattern recognition. So you can, it's basically heightened, you know, heightened communication. When they talk about it, you know, there's a real famous Bill Russell quote where he talks about group flow being on the basketball court. It feels like ESP. You know what everybody is thinking yeah. and all that stuff, right? Same thing happens across species lines. Right, you don't. I, I don't really feel like I have ESP with the dogs, but you kind of know where everybody is, and you work together as a collective unit. You get hive mind behavior, much more effective if you were trying to, you know, run down a, a large animal or, you know, anything along those lines. Very healing for the dogs. A phenomenally healing for the dogs. So they're <laughs> getting something they need from that. There's a, a guy, a Cody London, runs a tracker school. Have you ever heard of that? Which part? The Cody London part or the tracker school part? Both. I've, not the Cody London part. The okay. tracker schools I've so, heard of. So there's various tracker schools. Uh, Cody London's one of the guys, and there's there's actually Tom Brown is maybe more. Yeah, that's the this. guy I know. Yeah, so Tom's I think the original guy, and then uh, Cody also does one. But um, I've been interested in doing one or both of theirs. And Tom Brown writes a lot about essentially shamanic states, like altered states that he goes into. And he teaches people to go into when they're out in the forest. And he has them walk around barefoot and with no food for a couple days. And some pretty rough stuff in order to access you know, the animal mind, the hive mind kind of thing. And then when you have a group of humans hunting in a pack that he'll describe, and his, his books are fascinating, but that he knows where the animals are. He just somehow knows. So there are definitely altered states that happen in nature when there are groups of animals cooperating that involve at least Sensi sensitivity to other animals. I say definitely in that it's been reported and it's teachable, so that's a pretty good thing. Um, there's, uh, oh, I can't remember. Sorry, never mind. I had nothing interesting to say. Keep going. Yeah. So, I, I, number one, I was going to say, have you ever experimented with anything like that? You spend a lot of time outdoors doing extreme athletics, and do you think that there's correlation between those states and the flow state? Well, there's definitely, you know, one of the Big flow triggers, right, is a rich environment. Lots of novelty, yeah. complexity, and unpredictability. Mm -hmm. That's the natural world, right? So you're, you know, any time you're really going into nature and you're deciding to not walk, hike the trail that you've hiked every day, right? Which obviously if you're tracking animals and they're determining the path, it, there's a lot of novelty and unpredictability and complexity. You also need to track animals massively focused attention, right? Really, really focused attention. On the very fine little footprint things and really, everything, right? Really, really, really minute stuff. It's obviously stuff that you're going to be better at in flow. And there's a lot of really interesting kind of anthropological data about kind of tracking animals in flow states. And it's, you know, it's, it's hard it's hard to know what you're looking at, and you know you can't go back in time and talk to people and that kind of stuff. But um, it does seem like flow and animal tracking, you know, kind of evolve together for sure. Wow, this is all stuff that even uh, evolutionary uh, psychologists don't really seem to talk too much about, at least in my experience. Have you come across? The, I, yeah, there. I mean, there are. This? Yeah, there are some people. I, I mean, there are. I I'm really. I tend to think that. Evolution is one of those filters, evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology, it's just one of those filters that most of the really intelligent people that I've bumped into, they apply. People, yeah. right? <laughs> evolution is one of those filters where like, if you're smart, you apply it to facts because you know it's a good filter. Um, 
So, you know, a lot of the flow stuff has, you know, as I was learning it, as I was kind of, you know, I was running it by evolutionary psychologists and biologists all the time, because they'll, they'll call bullshit really quickly, yeah. right? And it's a great filter for that. So yeah, there are some people, but no, it's, these are, of course, really new ideas. Oh, well, they're, they're fascinating ideas, and I, I, I know why you run an animal sanctuary, but can you explain for people who are watching this why well, you do that? Um, so first of all, it, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different sides to this story. Yeah. One of the sides to the story is that my whole life when I was coming up as a journalist, right, I covered a lot of different things, but I would go extraordinarily far out of my way to hang out with scientists who were hanging out with animals. You know, so I spent some time with Patricia Wright in Madagascar studying lemurs, and I kept doing all these other things. And I was actually running, I'm a big believer in service. I think everybody should have a little service component in their life. I was running a different nonprofit. It was called the Reporters Gym. It was in LA. It was with the LA Lakers and um, Dave Eggers' organization, A26LA. And we were teaching inner city kids how to be sports writers, literacy as a, as a ticket out of poverty. And it was great, really changing lives. I didn't particularly love working with teenagers. It, was, it wasn't my thing. I, I like animals more than I like people. And I, it suddenly clicked that I was going extraordinarily far out of my way to go to hang out with animals. And I was running this, this service project. And why didn't I just you know, get away from helping people and go back to helping animals? It fit better with who I, who I was. Rancho de Chihuahua, when my wife and I started it, um, and this was her doing, I just didn't know any better. She said, you know, I want to work with hospice cases, I want to work with special needs dogs, and I want to work in a, in a very, very rural and poor community because those are all the gaps in the rescue network. Nobody wants to work with chihuahuas, yet they're the most euthanized dog in America, more than pit bulls. Wow. Nobody wants to work with special needs dogs or hospice dogs because the animals die or their special needs case, you'll work with them for a year, two years before you adopt them out and the emotional bonds are really strong and it's emotionally difficult to do. All this work is really, really emotionally difficult to do. And my wife was, you know, when she was proposing all this to me, she's like, well, I'm tough enough to take it. And I was like, well, okay, I guess, well, you know, what do I say at that point? Um, and so that's what we did. We tried to, we tried to kind of build an organization that, that filled huge gaps in the, in the rescue net. And it's tricky, like there's no, we're outside the kind of traditional funding models and things like that. So there was a lot of things we kind of had to reinvent along the way. Our healing methodologies are very, very different, all that stuff, but immensely rewarding and super, super fun. And, you know, it's, I also like, you know, with service, when, when it's in your life, when it's built in, right? I live, we live in the animal sanctuary, right? There's no, there's no separation. When I'm, you know, talking to you on a podcast, there's 15 dogs sitting around my, on my feet. Um, I like that. I like when it's integrated in my life. I found it was easier to be a little bit uncomfortable all the time rather than having to say, okay, this one day a week I'm going to go and this is my day I do service and I'm going to be, you know, took myself out of my life. I'd rather have it integrated into it and just, you know, reset what normal was than, rather than try to change it the other way. So it was part of your design for being in a, in a state of flow and just something that made you happy. Well, that's the other thing. I wanted to... So there's, and I spoke about it this morning at the conference, there's yeah. an altruism-based flow state, right? Helper's high. And one of the things about flow is the more flow you get, the more flow you get, right? You're training the brain. It's a skill set, and it crosses over. So if you're an athlete, and, you know, you're a skier, and you're getting lots of flow on the ski slopes, it's going to bleed into your work life, right? So now I've got my writing life, very flow-heavy, right? Creativity triggers flow. I've got, you know, when I have free time, I hurl myself down mountains at high speeds, very you know, good flow trigger, and then there's altruism, which is the other thing that, you know, is always there. So everything around me is a flow trigger. My whole life is designed to produce more of the state. Okay, that, that makes, it makes really good sense. And when people read The Rise of Superman, you describe this, this pretty yeah. accurately. So if you haven't had a chance to read The Rise of Superman, uh, Stephen's latest book, uh, it's, it's a read worth having. It, it's, it, really, I would say, a work of art, a, a great book. And, and if you haven't read The Bulletproof Diet, also <laughs> a work of art. It's not available yet, Stephen. Oh, sorry about that. But <laughs> <laughs> Although you might have an early PDF of it. I think we I, sent that I, to you. I, we I did, did. Cause, yeah. It's phenomenal. In fact, that's because you're on the book jacket. You had the very first uh, PDF that came out, I'm of honored. course. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, order bulletproofdietbook.com. So. <laughs> <laughs> what he said. And you've been on the New York Times list multiple times, right? Yeah. So uh, the previous book you wrote with Peter Diamandis, it was Abundance? Abundance. 
right? What was it like working with Peter? I mean, he's a Peter and I are great. Guy. Yeah, Peter yeah. and I, Peter and I work really, really, really well together. We have a tremendous amount of fun, um, and uh, we. It's a, it's a good complementary relationship for us. Even when we were coming to abundance, I had I came to abundance from a book called Small Furry Prayer, which was about the relationship between humans and animals. It's a lot about the work we do in New Mexico. And as somebody who's deeply passionate about animals, I'm deeply passionate about biodiversity. And so I had yeah. been working on how do you protect biodiversity? Those were the things I'd been thinking about. Peter, who likes people more than, you know, more than animals, had been working on how do you you know, heal the planet and save people. So yeah. we, you know, these two streams came together into abundance and it worked really, really well. I had a chance to spend a day with Peter uh, at the, the Joe Polish event and got to know him a little bit and what a fascinating guy. It, it was really cool because I, I share that biodiversity uh, thing with him because biodiversity is something that starts in the soil and it moves into the animals and it moves into us and if we don't have that biodiversity, it, it's going to hurt our performance, but it's multi-generational and, it, and it's gnarly because you're not responsible or in control of what your grandmother or your mother did, yet you're, you're bearing the fruits or paying the costs of that. And if we build the world to be more biodiverse, people can do all sorts of things, like even be in a flow state better, which is the other thing that I care a lot about. That's why I'm like, how did I get to meet these two guys in the same year? It was, it was kind of amazing. That's fun. Uh, I have some questions about the flow state, though. I spent some time today uh, at the Flow Genome Project here at the Bulletproof Biohacking Conference. And one of the things was awesome. It was a, it was essentially, a, you're hanging in the air, and it's like riding a half pipe. Uh, another one is being inside a, uh, a gyroscope. So you're spinning around upside down. The other one is this ridiculous swing that I broke, sorry. Um, <laughs> where you're, you're standing on a surfboard and you can swing all the way upside down. And you have a great way of explaining why these sort of amazing acrobatics are doing something for us. And you have sort of three big buckets. Can you walk me through those buckets and why this stuff matters for flow state? Sure. So as we know, flow states have triggers, right? These are preconditions that bring on more flow. There's about 17 of them that we know of. There are probably actually more, um, but 17 that we know of. And three of them, we call these the, the environmental triggers or external triggers, are high consequences, rich environment and deep embodiment. And let's look at all of them because these are what all, all our toys are essentially about these three triggers, right? To back it up, and let me come at it a different way. One of the things that we discovered in the work that the Flow Genome Project does is, and we've known this for a while, action adventure sport athletes are phenomenal flow hackers. Some of the best flow hackers in the history of the world. One of the reasons is they're exposed to zero Gs, multiple Gs, and polyaxial rotation, right? So weightlessness, weightedness, and polyaxial rotation is rotation around your middle. As I said, deep embodiment is one of these triggers. Deep embodiment means you're paying attention to multiple sensory streams at once, right? It's not just your five senses, it's also proprioception, vestibular awareness, so balance, body position, and space. All this stuff, when you're paying attention to multiple sensory streams, it drives attention to now, and it precipitates flow. Action and adventure sport athletes get this all the time because if you're pulling multiple Gs or zero Gs or polyaxial rotation, we're gravity bound creatures, right? We're not used to those sensations. So as soon as you feel one, everything drives attention into the now. Most people, if they're not interested in action and adventure sports, it's because they don't, they don't want to hurt themselves, right? So what we created in the Flow Dojo is a way to suspend the consequences of gravity, right? We've created machines that basically create these same inputs, but there's no danger, right? You can't actually hurt yourself on them. But the other thing about them is you can't drive them with your brain, right? You have to be in your body. People, if, people, if you try to muscle on them or out think that it's not gonna work, you actually have to feel your way through these machines and they're not, they're all human momentum powered, but they're not exactly, as you found out, super easy to use. It takes a little while and you have to kind of, so you're training up the deep embodiment trigger. Rich environment, which is a fancy way of saying lots of novelty, complexity, and unpredictability in the environment, right? Again, very big flow triggers. All of our toys, novel, unpredictable, complex, right? All that stuff. So again, and high consequences, which is risk. It doesn't matter if it's real or perceived. It's also a flow trigger. So we've created an environment where there are lots of kind of built-in flow triggers. The whole second half of this is that there's a whole tech side to it, right? And we've got 
heart rate variability monitors and EEG and you know some of the stuff you know as we move forward and the technology gets a little bit better we'll be able to incorporate kind of real-time neural feedback into the devices for right right now the noise of motion is a little tricky we can only do it afterwards but we're starting to incorporate more of that and we're also wiring people up head to toe in kind of sensors as they're riding this stuff so as it's putting them into flow we're data capturing so what this is going to allow us to do long run is take a big data approach to taking flow state research to the next level and that's never been done before so we're really excited about the possibilities with that I, this is just like a biohacker's sort of wet dream, basically, because you're getting all the data. We're going to get data from multiple people. And one of the, the challenges, whenever you're dealing with altered states, is that there aren't really words for them. Even flow state. There's different people who probably believe a flow state is, feels like this, it feels like that. When you're trying to teach meditation, you go to you know, what, what the Buddhists say, you know, open the thousand petal lotus above the left nipple two inches. And you're like, what? Like, like I, this doesn't translate to me. Yet that was the distilled wisdom of people trying to say, well, there's this feeling and it's like there's <laughs> multiple layers and it's like kind of, sometimes I sense a green color, right? So, but not everyone senses things the same way. When we can tease the data out of that using big data, then all of a sudden we can say, well, do whatever makes the data look like, like that. that. <laughs> right. That's exactly. I mean, like yeah. with the neural feedback, one of, we know, for example, flow is from brain waves. It's on the border between alpha theta, right? Yep. So, the big looping swing. This is not theta situation, but the next iteration, we're going to have you in a wireless EEG helmet, and it, the whole looping swing, as you've noticed, is lined, lined in lights. And the closer you get to that alpha theta borderline, it's going to glow blue and the farther away it's gonna glow red, right? So you have real-time neural feedback. You don't have to break state and look at a screen and say, how am I doing, yeah. right? Because it's built into the colors of the mm -hmm. thing. And so not only will you have these, all these flow triggers that you're playing with, but you'll have real-time neural feedback to try to train your brain, too. It, it seems like you'd wanna use sound, not light, because when, when your eyes are open, you suppress alpha normally. You are right about that, and we do have some sound stuff too. Well, they've, the gy I was <laughs> thinking vibration would be better. Have, well, that, have cell phone motors the haptic on. stuff Love is it. for sure the best. Yeah. We've over across the boards when we're looking for any kind of any kind of feedback. It seems that haptic is yeah. the easiest thing for people to respond to. Haptic and my ultimate fantasy feedback device. Someone make this for me, please. I'll buy it. Um, it uses a, a tongue sensor. You know, they have those are great. Printers. Yeah, for, for blind but, people. Yeah, because your tongue is the best sensory organ probably that you have for a lot of things. It's certainly well, thank for feedback. You. So, oh, you mean just everybody in general, you know, not yours, just me? I, I okay. Mean, <laughs> So what, uh, what happens there, if, if you're listening to this and you haven't heard of that, is blind people can actually see with their tongue when a computer takes an image and translates it into pixels and then transmits them to your tongue because your tongue is that sensitive. Mm -hmm. So you can have a full, very thin, comfortable display on your tongue while you're moving, while you're swinging, or while you're downhill skiing or something. And I fully see that we'll be doing stuff like that sensitive parts of your skin, you can put a patch on those and get very rich data once you train the nervous mm -hmm. system. But So when I did this swing, uh, the, this thing is incredible, I felt exactly what you're saying. There's a line of thinking, but when you're dealing with gravity, you can't think as fast as gravity acts. <laughs> right, that's it, fair. Right, like you'll Absolutely. fall down. And, <laughs> and so you're not gonna think how you walk, you learn to walk and most of it is automated. Like, like there's a little bit of conscious directional change, but for the most part, it's totally invisible. How do you balance? Use words for that. There are no words. You balance until you fall over. Do what makes you not fall over. So well, it's so you you rode the it, it's called the psycho swing, and it's basically yeah. you know a free standing. It's it's like being in a half pipe or in a snowboard park or mm -hmm. in a skate park, right? And it's essentially like riding a swing, right? People get on it, and you can always tell if there's no hiding from it, right? Yep. People are either in their body or they're not in their body, and if they get on it and they're not in their body, and they try to think their way through it, they cannot figure it out. You just stand there and wobble. Right, yeah. and then, but usually, sooner or later, even when they're doing that, right, they, at one point, they're, sooner or later, some, it's, they're gonna go forward, and that memory of being on a swing set as a kid is gonna kick in, because the sensation's gonna be the same, and you watch it, and it's like the program gets uploaded, they go from, totally klutzy and oh my god what am I doing and so then you watch this thing just go chink, 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 and they suddenly know how to move the thing because their body actually understands it. it's really fun to watch and so what's going on from an experiential perspective there is they're actually stopping thinking mm -hmm. so they can start feeling and then being in their body 
And most of us, especially in the West, it, it's, those words don't mean anything. The thinking versus feeling. Right. At least they didn't for me as a young man, because I'd say, well, I could think about my feelings. Therefore, like feelings are subject to thought. But when you're in a situation like that, where you have to go with what the body's telling you instead of what the brain tells you, it can be really unnerving. So do do people get you know, afraid when they're on that? Yeah. So I mean, obviously these are you know high consequences of trigger. So you know they they do feel kind of you know at a certain point they do start to some of them can. Scare them on the gyroscope. The, the first time you go upside down mm -hmm. and you go backwards, these are not normal sensations to most people. So yeah, there's a lot. And on the big swing, obviously, um, there's a there's a lot of fear there. there it, it's yeah. built in. And the surf swing that you rode, that's the scaled down model. There's a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. um, once you get to the bigger one, that where it's a huge 30 foot arc, that there's <laughs> there's I more fear there. Can't wait to be on that giant one. And I, I did the the big swing. And the big swing, it's, it's kind of scary because you're standing, not sitting, and your feet are strapped in, and your arms are strapped in, so you're probably not gonna die. But you, you're using a whole body to pump this thing, and you pump it to the point that it goes all the way upside down and, and goes again. And I got three quarters of the way up, so I'm upside down, I'm almost there. And in order to get it, you have to really yeah, lean. you have to you have right. to lean with your chest. But, but your natural protective response is <laughs> go backwards. Yeah, so I'd get right there, and, and it took me about four or five swings before I, I you realized. See, you, 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 can, yeah, you can yeah, you can watch yeah. people on it because yeah. they they have this battle with themselves. Mm -hmm. It's really funny because the way the only way to break the plane is to do the thing that makes you most vulnerable, yeah, right? You don't want to do forward, it, right? right. Uh, so I, I I did that, and I was just getting there, and then one of the foot attachments broke. You broke our toys. I did. And I wasn't so even there th for that. Th that was my, wow, this is exciting, but uh, fortunately, uh, I'm not a panicky Which is why we have a very good waiver. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it, it, I think it was just the binding thing, and it was still, I have was three points attached, not four. There was no danger there at right. all. Uh, so I, I came down. So I haven't had a chance to get upside down on that thing yet, but I really want to give it a try because you can feel the fear coming from the body, and it's totally irrational. It has nothing to do with what I'm thinking about. And to be able to draw that line for me has been an enormous gift. But mostly, mine's come from neurofeedback because just well, yeah, finding I mean, that line. Heart, that heart rate variability is oh, really good for that, where you right? Start, yeah. Because you can, you can. I mean, part of a flow hacking is you know, in, in a lot of situations, flow is found on the other side of fight or flight, right? You okay. you want to use the kind of extra neurochemical boost you're getting from fight or flight and follow that focus into flow. You don't want to give into the fight or flight, and that's all about breathing, heart rate variability, all, all these things, and staying calm. So one of the things that's really great about the surf swing is it trains you to do that. It trains you not to panic, because if you panic, you literally can't work the device, right? Your it, chest is gonna fold in. Yeah, it, it's the real-time feedback, mm -hmm. but it's gravitational real-time feedback, and it, I really did feel it. I, I, didn't, I didn't feel a sense of uh, panic, and I think if I had the HRV stuff on me, me measuring my sympathetic fight or flight response, I don't think it would have got too high, but there was a definite physical closing in that would cancel my swing motion. And that's not something that most people are ever going to experience. Right. And not just experience, but I mean, you're swinging. Well, I, darn, I did it wrong last time, let me do it again. Uh, let me do it again, let me do it again. And to do it in short order, that's what triggers learning in the nervous system and in the body. And this is why I'm stoked to be supporting the Flow Genome Project. Um, because it's it, it's the sort of thing that even though I used to do mountain biking a lot as a kid, you know, some downhill stuff, and I remember very distinctly going into a flow state. Let's say I'm doing 35 miles an hour, and if I hit that rock, I'll probably die. So I'm going to find a path, and like the world tunnels in, and, and every, most people have been in it at some point or another. But to be able to practice pushing that right there, even just for five minutes on the swing, it, it's remarkable. Uh, so I, I'm going to incorporate some of those in my biohacking facility. Yeah, it's, yeah. and it's and the, and the other thing is, I mean, as long as you can find ways to push up the challenge skills equation, right? So you're staying kind of on that edge. Um, it keeps working, and you're 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 training a part of your brain and your body that most people don't even get access to. And once you actually start training it up, really amazing things start happening. As you, what what as happens? You kind of point it out. Well, I mean, you just, it's easier access into flow. It's easier access into flow, and it translates, right? Bravery kind of works across situations, as you know, right? Yeah. So, little, little bit of effort on one, I mean, that's why there's a kind of a protocol with lots of different devices, and we can walk you up baby steps from wherever you are, right? The, the, flow, the flow Dojo is designed for everybody from, I've got, you know, first time I was ever around the, the looping swing, my partner, Jamie Wheels, 
11 year old daughter was trying for a world <laughs> record on it, right? She was, how many loops can you do in a day? And I got it, it was the very first time I was on it. I was terrified, I couldn't even get it above, you know, really here, mm -hmm. and she, this 11 year old girl is showing me up. I, I love it, and in fact, being upside down is neurologically useful for people. So ever since my kids were, were born, I'd, I'd carefully hold them upside down, and now I don't think they see a difference between being upside down and right side up. So you know, I, I pick them up, I flip them around, and they just think it, it's fun, but the fear response that almost all of us have, like when I learned to do handstands in yoga, uh, I've spotted hundreds of people in yoga classes, and it, people scream, and they're, they're terrified, and they're shaking and quaking just from being upside down, because the body is essentially overwhelming the mind at that point, right? The fear response is so big. And what you're doing in Flow Genome there is you're basically showing them the fear response so that they can see it and sense it and feel it and get to know it without skinning their knee or whacking their head right. on something sharp. Right, right. And, we're, and you can downregulate it, right, over time. Yeah. You learn to suppress it, and it's also, you know, it translates as an athlete, you know, I spend a bunch of time on our, on our equipment, and then I go downhill mountain biking, and I, you know, it, I can, when I start to feel the fight or flight response coming up, I can move through it, and into flow a lot easier. My chances of, of panic and crashing and dying go down. So, so there's a, a level of input, in, a level of, we'll call it emergency input, that people are capable of before they go into blanked out, um, essentially automated programming. And we know this from studying SWAT teams and all. And they're actually trained very carefully to recognize, okay, I, I went into this state, now I, I sort of devolved to my training and I'll pull my gun and I'll fire in this order and I'll, like every little thing, but it, none of it's conscious. It, it's just built in and it comes from reaching that level. Is it your understanding from Flow Genome that we can actually train that level so that it's higher? So yes. that you're still in a conscious state, yeah. whereas most people would be freaked out, terrified, and not present, yeah. but you're still there. Well, you're gonna get one of two things, right, as, as it goes up, it's fight, flight, or freeze. And, you know, I, one of the craziest experiences mm -hmm. I ever had, I was rock climbing, and uh, I was very exposed. I was high up above my protection, so if I took a fall, it was kind of a death fall, and the rock I was holding onto pulled out of the wall. And I was about 50 feet from the top, and the boulder was heading right at my training partner. So I screamed rock. He dove out of the way. And the last thing I remember is I was moving backwards, kind of off the wall. And the next thing I knew, I was 40 feet above me, on my belly, crawling towards the anchors. And I have no memory of what happened. And he, was, he, had, he dove out of the way to avoid the rock, so he has no idea. Wow. Right? Totally checked my brain out. And, you know, I got to the top of the climb, but it had... I mean, literally, I wasn't even there. I have no memory of it. And you know, when, it, when I was on top of the rock, I was like, well, okay, this is either like divine intervention, but I sure didn't, like, doesn't that usually come with a sense of like, there's no angels are coming yeah, down and saving yeah. your ass? Or, you know, like, and there was none of that. And I was like, well, the, and there were no aliens who picked me up in their spaceship, because I, you know, you kind of. You, you look for implants. Right, I, I, none of that. <laughs> so I was like, all right, this must be like natural, but I have no, I like, still this day, I still have yeah. no idea how I got to the top, but it was the first time I saw that what that actually happens like when your brain totally checks out and performs any and you perform anyways on that way but yeah you can kind of stretch out you can stay conscious in higher pressure situations over and over and i think you know i think it really translates and you know action adventure sport athletes talk about this a lot i mean so one of the things that in western culture especially we have really balkanized death we've moved we you know we've kind of hide our old people away, we send them off to nursing homes, right? I mean, one of the things about working with an animal sanctuary is death is a daily part of our lives. We work with sick old animals. And, you know, in action adventure sports, injury is a daily part of your life. But there's something about kind of confronting that. I come from back from a day in a downhill mountain biking, and it really doesn't matter what, you know, what kind of problem I was having as a rider, right? It doesn't compare. Like, I might, you know, on Friday, before if I'm going to ride on Saturday, I could have the biggest problems in the world Right? I go riding, I confront some level of mortal fear, it resets my nervous system at a totally different level, and the problems that I was dealing with the day before look tiny in comparison, and my performance goes way up, which, you know, <laughs> I don't know if you can tell people that, you know, getting more comfortable being around death and dismemberment is a, is a, is a good thing for work performance, but it actually is. Buddhist teachings are that, that all fear is fear of death. And the more neurofeedback I've done, and the more I've dug into my own crap, 
pretty much every fear, it comes down to an irrational fear of death. So you might think, well, fear of being alone, well, it comes down to if I'm alone, no one will feed me. If no one feeds me, I'll starve, then I'll die. And it's this dumb little thing, and none of it's rational. It's all like neurological. So yeah, I, I'm of the same opinion there, that anything you can do to allow you to stare death in the face and go, yep, that's death, mm -hmm. uh, without running away and without jumping towards it, either one, but to, to be accepting and and that it's liberating in a whole bunch of ways that don't make any sense at all. We do a great exercise at the Flow Genome Project that makes people very, very uncomfortable. We ask people to write their own obituary. Nice. Which is a really, which is great. I mean, it's yeah. really like, it's really, write your, write your own obituary and judge your own life and, you know, and make decisions that way. And it, you know, it makes you think about your mortality and it makes you kind of really come, it's a very, very deeply, deeply powerful exercise for people. I, it's not one I've done, and it's, it's one I can imagine, though, and I don't think it would bother me in the slightest, given the, the things, just the, the training that I've done, um, but I think it would be bothersome for most people. Uh, and it's, it's one of the things, we'll do it afterwards. But you are not most people. Oh, I'm not, no. <laughs> uh, but I've done all this huge, I mean, I've spent uh, six and a half weeks with electrodes stuck to my head. Uh, with a lie detector telling me when I'm lying to myself about things ranging from death and all these other things. That's amazing. I, well, I, I, people say, well, how, what do you do all the things you could do? I'm like, well, I sort of learned how to get out of my own way. And it, everyone finds their own path of doing that sort of stuff, and I use a lot of tech. But I, I'm really intrigued because even though I've done that, when I get on that giant upside down swing, I still You're find still amygdala that my, function is amygdala my, function, my, my right? Body, you can't beat it. You know, my body, yes, I can. Give me time. <laughs> like, you know, my body gives me that thing. So it's, it's, it's an ongoing challenge and finding ways to, to see how your body does something without your permission or knowledge and then to become aware of it and then to become in control of it is like the path of becoming a better human. And one of the things I, I always think is interesting, um, you know, Laird Hamilton was the first person who said it to me, but I he, totally... He's here at the conference. Oh, is he? Yeah, yeah. Laird, I mean, you know, if you, if you ask Laird, you know, are you afraid out there? He's like, I'm afraid all the time. <laughs> Right? You're just, you just deal with it and you get mm -hmm. better at dealing with it. People think that in action adventure sport, sports, these athletes, you know, there's bravery. No, they're just as terrified as you are. They've just learned through practice to push through it and take all that energy, meaning all that neurochemistry really, mm -hmm. and utilize it, right? It, it's, it's a remarkable thing to understand that, that facing terror teaches you to face life, actually, not just death. Absolutely. Wow. Stephen, I always have a great time. I just want to just hang out and chat with you, and we get to do that on occasion. Uh, next time I'm in New Mexico, we'll definitely do that over some green chili. Uh, I grew up in New Mexico, so definitely miss that. We're up on the end of our show, and I've already asked you your top three things that are for people who want to perform best. Right. I ask that at the end of all these interviews. So I'm trying to figure out what else I should ask you. So I'm going to go meta on you. So what question should I ask you at the end of the show that would be most useful for people? This is just, this isn't even fair. <laughs> what, what, I, what, um, say something that so people So no, you know what, I will, I will say, yeah. I'll, I'll give you something. Because um, we were talking about, I, I, I did a different podcast. I'm sorry, I was cheating on you. Um, <laughs> but I, 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 this week, and somebody else asked me this question. And this is one thing that, that I've noticed. Um, so just because of the way the brain has worked, where we privilege negative emotions, we privilege neg negative memories, and one of the things, and I think it's, it's most useful to people, is very few people seem to trust their own history. Like, you have a record you're, of all the things you were good at in your life, right? We, we pay a lot of attention to things we were bad at, but we don't look back and, like, notice all the little skills that you were actually good at along the way, and I think looking back over your life and going, Oh, you know what? In difficult socio situations in foreign countries, I actually, over time, I've been four or five of these situations, I've done really, really well. And when you start kind of looking for those patterns, what are the weird little things you've succeeded at? There's a whole alternate record of your life and of success, and I think it, it points in interesting directions where you should move in the future. So I think people pay a lot of attention to the negative, re the, rec the mm -hmm. failures, but there's the tiny microscopic successes that you never notice. Those are the things I think are really, really valuable to use as kind of a directional arrow. 
So would you tie that in with gratitude, essentially being grateful, noticing them and then being grateful for those, or is that a separate thing? I think gratitude is a separate thing. I think gratitude, okay. we've talked about this, but I think yeah. gratitude is extremely useful, especially, you have to linger on it, by the way. This is, I don't, you know, gratitude lists are something we use all the time at the Flow Genome Project. And there's a lot of re neurobiological reasons we use it, but one of the most important things when people, you know, to use gratitude is again, this goes back to amygdala function, right? We have a what Daniel Kahneman called a negativity bias, a tendency to privilege negative information over positive information. So if you want to actually, you have something called an emotional set point, right? It's, it's basically how you felt. It's why you essentially feel the same way as an adult that you did as a little kid, right? It's because your emotions exist kind of in a very particular bandwidth. It's very difficult to reset your emotional set point to be, I want to be happier. One of the only ways you can do it is actually reflect on and linger on positive emotions because we don't do that very often, right? We will linger on the negative emotions and what happens with the amygdala when you privilege the negative is it becomes more sensitive over time, right? Well, the exact opposite works as well when you start to kind of linger on the positive. So you make your gratitude list, I am so happy that my dogs are healthy today or whatever it is yeah. that you're, you're, you're being thankful for, but you want to linger on that feeling for about 10 seconds because we don't do that, but it retrains the brain and it can alter your emotional set point. Every night when I tuck my kids in, we do a gratitude list. And I'm just building it into the way they see the world because I think it's one of the more important things I can do as a parent. And yeah, I agree with you. Jamie does it. I don't have any children, so I do it with my chihuahuas. And I don't quite know if it works for them as well. Jamie does it with his kids, my partner at the Flow Genome Project. So, yeah. yeah. I, I think it makes them happy. And, and they, they teach you stuff. Um, the other day, Anna, she's seven, uh, just out of the blue said, I'm grateful for the Big Bang because without it, there wouldn't be anything. Like, so cool. That's great. <laughs> no, That's great. Uh, on that note, on that, we can't beat the big fans with Anna. <laughs> on that note, Stephen, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for being on Bulletproof Radio again, and uh, thanks for coming to the conference and being our keynote speaker and bringing all those big toys, man. It, it's been such a blast, and people, everyone's coming up to me just saying what an experience it's been to to play with those things. They loved your keynote, so thanks again. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. One of the unusual tools that I use with my clients is called the Upgraded Focus Brain Trainer. What it is, is a headband, one like this. You can train your brain to move blood from the back of the brain to the front of the brain. You have the conscious ability to do this. And when you do it right, it increases your ability to pay attention. Your cognitive focus goes up. The next ingredient that is absolutely required. You owe it to yourself to try it made this way one time. It's called brain octane oil. Brain octane oil is 18 times stronger than coconut oil, specifically for mental clarity. It's designed for metabolic function.